Council Member. Thank you for your leadership. Um, we recognize that as Philadelphians, this has been an incredibly um, trying week in an already inc incredibly trying year. Um, we figured from a conversation standpoint, we'd give you the opportunity to um, share some remarks and then um, folks can put their questions in the chat um, and we can also have a conversation as well. But wanted you to have the floor. Um, because you've had some incredible thoughts. Um, we will also post your op-ed in um, the chat um, function as well, because uh, we all were very moved by the thoughtfulness and your leadership that you demonstrated in it. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think my entire district um, in the whole city is reeling from what happened um, the other day. Um, Walter Wallace Jr. was a young black man who had struggled with mental illness for his entire life. And on Monday, he needed help. He needed um, support and care. Um, and instead of getting that, he was gunned down by officers um, in front of his own mother, um, in front of his own neighbors who were literally begging the police not to shoot him. And so, you know, it's just, it's um, beyond traumatic um, for the family, um, especially. Um, I talked to his mother um, and several members of his family on the night, um, on the day that it, that it happened. Um, I met his wife who is very pregnant. Um, they're, they're distraught as you can imagine um, and they're traumatized. Um, but it's also traumatic and tragic um, for our entire community. And um, there's just a sense that we're all in, in mourning. Um, and there's also a lot of anger um, that this could happen again, particularly um, over after the summer that we've had when people have been out in the streets um, demanding justice. Um, and out in the streets um, asking for the Philadelphia Police Department and for police everywhere to, um, to change. And I think this incident makes it clear that not only do we have so far to go, um, I think we've been set back. We've been set back a great deal. Um, and seeing the video footage you know, it, I, I think it's apparent to everyone that what happened was wrong. Um, in the video footage, um, Walter Wallace Jr., you know, is clearly having a mental health episode. Um, he's holding a small knife, um, but he's not within striking distance of the officers. And I think the video clearly shows that instead of trying to de-escalate the situation, instead of trying to um, resort to non-fatal weapons um, that, they, that they should have had, um, they went straight for their guns. They went straight for their guns and they shot him until he was dead and in front of everyone. And, you know, I, I think that the use of that type of force should be an absolute last resort for anybody who's entrusted with public safety. And I also can't help um, but to feel that if this were a white man, um, that they would have paused. If this were a white man, they would have done something differently, different than just go straight for their guns. Um, and it's sad to me that after so much time, so many decades of seeing this type of um, police violence, um, that the police in this city still can't see the humanity of the Black people they're supposed to serve. It's so angering. Um, and so, you know, I, I just think we have to have change here. Um, we have to have justice here. Um, we have to have an acknowledgement that this was wrong. And that's outside of, I don't care what the investigation shows. We all saw what happened. 
Um, and I don't care if the, the officers were acting according to their protocol. If they were, um, then the protocol is, is wrong. And so I think we have to have um, transparency. I think we have to have a speedy and quick um, resolution um, that includes accountability for these officers. Um, and I think we have to equip ourselves as a city to serve people who are suffering from mental health issues. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, I was actually, I was applauding the department um, because they had released a story about how they're now um, including a mental health professional in their ranks and they'll have um, mental health professionals to go out on calls with officers. But it became apparent after Monday's um, happenings that this is a small pilot. It's something that we're not investing in um, to the extent that we, that we need to. Um, and that's problematic, particularly given that many of the calls that come into um, the police department are for mental health crises. We need to have an answer other than armed um, police. And so um, I, I'm calling for, for justice, um, for a transparent and speedy investigation um, that, that ends in some kind of accountability, um, for us to invest more in um, serving people who have mental health issues, but also I'm calling for um, our police um, to do some work, right? To do some work, to have more um, training in um, anti-bias um, and to um, really be fit to serve in the black communities um, that they're supposed to be keeping safe. Um, and so that's where I am. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? I certainly, um, I certainly do, but want to make sure that this really is a community conversation. Um, Council member, in the article you wrote and, uh, and in the remarks you made to um, your constituents, um, I think on, on Tuesday evening, you talked about um, that uh, between 25 and 50 percent of um, some of the shootings that have happened are believed to be uh, folks with mental health crisis. Um, how do you think we can escalate the pilot um, and what does that look like? And are there opportunities, um, you know, from a broader community standpoint to help with that? I think it looks like um, taking stock of our sizable police budget. We, um, you know, at, at this point, the police budget is, um, I believe, $727 million. Mm -hmm. And so we need to look at how we're spending that money. Um, you know, on, on, on 52nd Street on May 31st, um, we had tanks going up and down the street. We were able to deploy tear gas. Over the past several days, there have been helicopters monitoring um, the neighborhood constantly. Maybe we can move money from some, some of that military equipment um, into the services that people need when they're experiencing a mental health episode. So I think that um, it's about how we allocate our, our funding and, and it's about how we prioritize what people in our communities need. And also there's no excuse in my opinion for those officers not to have had tasers. There's absolutely no excuse for it. And I think I might've heard, and maybe I misunderstood this, but it was like a five-year plan for the whole force to be equipped with tasers. And maybe I misunderstood that information, but it did seem like it was an extended period of time until the entire police force would actually be equipped with them. Again, I think that that's about how we prioritize and what we think is important. Absolutely. One of the um, things that I think is really incredibly um, meaningful in the conversation is really around this idea of mental health um, and um, how we also need to remove the stigma 
for mental health. So for so long, um, if someone you know broke their ankle, it's something that you can see. Whereas people who are suffering um, from a mental health crisis, it's oftentimes much harder. It's oftentimes swept under the rug. It's oftentimes not talked about. Um, ironically, we have scheduled a session at five o'clock, which I would encourage folks to attend as well, um, in conjunction with the Economy League, um, which is on the mental health crisis in the millennial generation and recognizing um, that they've put together something called the Well City Challenge um, to be able to have these conversations. And unfortunately, um, you know, with Walter Wallace Jr.'s death as a backdrop, it just indicates how important this conversation is um, sooner rather than later. Um, what other opportunities are there from a um, de-escalation training standpoint? I know that was one of the key points that you talked about tonight, but you've also um, communicated previously. How, what does that look like? Um, I'm not familiar with, you know, the, the intimate details of what uh, de-escalation training includes, but I would imagine that through those trainings, we would be trying to um, have officers use as much restraint as possible. Um, with the Walter Wallace situation, he was dead in like less than a minute, right? And he wasn't within striking off, uh, striking distance of the officers. Um, there was room for them to um, retreat there was room for them to pause. There was room for them to um, employ a different response um, before resorting to the use of deadly force, particularly with someone um, who, you know, is using a weapon that is much, much less lethal. Um, so I would imagine that de-escalation training would be trying to instill, you know, those practices. Keep asking questions unless someone interrupts. Um, so um, the title of your op-ed piece was All Eyes Are On Philly. And, um, and it's sad for all eyes to be on, on Philly for this particular, um, you know, kind of horrific reason. Um, what do you want to say to, you know, the broader world about what Philly really stands for and what are the steps that we can take to make change? Um, I think we have to show the broader world what we stand for um, by making sure that we can move forward from this point um, and by making sure that we bring radical change. Um, I would like, um, you know, I, I, what happened was unacceptable. And I would like for, for that to be stated really clearly from the people who lead this city, right? Um, and I think that the people in our neighborhoods um, are wanting to hear that too. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that we, you know, police culture in, in Philadelphia has been toxic um, and harmful to black people for a really, really long time. Um, today in council, I introduced a formal resolution to um, apologize on behalf of city council for the move bombing, which happened in this same neighborhood um, 35 years ago. Um, and so you have have entire neighborhoods that have suffered um, trauma and pain at the hands of the state time and time again. But at the same time, um, there's no real recognition of that from the policing institution. And there's no change in, in practices that, that respond um, to that context. Um, officers who um, are, are policing neighborhoods have to recognize the history of the neighborhoods that they're working within. And they have to be able to build relationships um, with the people who live in those neighborhoods. Um, you know, some of you might have seen, um, for example, during the, the protest in May and June, um, there were armed white vigilantes um, defending like the Columbus statue, right? Um, or in defending other, other um, landmarks in their neighborhoods um, from what they thought was a threat uh, from, from protesters and rioters. Um, in those videos, you'll see police piling around with those folks. They're carrying bats and they're carrying weapons, but police don't see them as a threat. They see them as friends. And that's because they can recognize 
recognize them as people. They have to be able to recognize the people in my district as people if they're going to work here. Um, and that's something that hasn't happened um, in decades, right? Um, I also think that we have to change our, our definition of, of how we're thinking of, of public safety. Um, too often, we're only offering neighborhoods um, police. Um, but pe people in neighborhoods need, need different things. Um, sending police on Monday to the home of um, Walter Wallace Jr. didn't keep anybody safe. It ended up in an unnecessary death. What he needed was support and care. And so um, we have to invest more in the things like mental health care um, that keep people safe. But there also are a variety of other things that people within neighborhoods need um, and that they need more than police in order to thrive. Um, and then I would also say that I would hope that, you know, our city realizes um, that to move forward, that police reform is connected to other things. Um, like gun violence. We recently crossed the threshold of 400 homicides in our, in our city. And, that, and that's another area where I feel like we're not um, investing enough in, um, in, in trying to solve this problem. Um, but it is a problem that is uh, directly connected towards uh, to po police reform. If people see the police as an illegitimate body that's going to be harmful to them and that they can't trust, they're not going to work with them to, to solve gun violence. Further, they're going to um, take their own, uh, they're, they're going to take justice in their own hands. And so um, for a host of reasons, we have to make a change here and create an environment that's truly safe for everyone everyone, including the black and brown people who live in the city. Yeah, um, I, I genuinely um, hear what you're saying and, and also recognize that without that trust, we're actually not going to get folks who to apply to the academies to become police officers so they could be police officers in their neighborhood. So there definitely is um, a vicious cycle that we're on. Um, I think Emily had a question that she wanted to pose. Yeah, so kind of touching on that and just this sort of disjointed relationship between the police and the community that they're meant to protect. Um, I'm just curious, like what sort of, whether it's a, a service or a program can be done? Cause I, I agree that there should be additional services offered to the community, um, but with the police still being there, what can be done to kind of improve that relationship um, you know, as, as the police remain in the community? Well, one, I think we should do a lot of listening um, I think that we have to listen to the people who are most police um, in neighborhoods about what it feels like for them to traverse everyday life, right? Um, and then I think the way we police um, should respond to that. Um, secondly, I think that we should do a better job making sure that um, police understand the neighborhoods that they're moving within. Um, I, you know, it, it was apparent that um, these officers were not from West Philadelphia. Um, and it was um, apparent that, I mean, I, I won't go so far as to say they didn't know Walter Wallace, but it's confusing to me. The response was confusing to me being that um, it should have been known that this was a person that had um, mental health issues, right? So I think our officers have to be more equipped to understand the neighborhoods that they're in and more equipped to um, deal with situations um, uh, when people are in crises. But also, I think we have to um, examine um, what we're using police for. I, I, I don't believe that um, police need to be used in all the ways that we're using them today. So obviously police have to have a role in um, solving, uh, in responding to and solving um, homicides and shootings, right? Um, but um, could we be investing more in social workers and um, mental health professionals that can help people within neighborhoods? Could we be investing more in um, reading directing young people who uh, might be at risk um, for participating in violence? Can we connect them to real meaningful jobs? Um, can we increase um, the amount of safe activities that we have within our neighborhoods for young people? Um, and so I think it's not just about um, the programs that um, need to exist between police and community. I think it's about the other investments that we have to make in neighborhoods and people um, to really help them, them thrive. 
I, and I, I also want to say that um, we have to actively work on police culture. I don't know if anyone saw um, John McNesby's statement um, on Monday night after the shooting. Um, he used his words to console and offer thoughts and prayers to the officers um, that just shot a man who needed mental care. So his, his entire statement was devoted to uh, um, offering, um, my cat wants to be in this conversation. <laughs> towards offering his condolences to the officers. He didn't even acknowledge that a man's life was taken and he didn't acknowledge um, what that means for his family and his community and for the city. And, and I thought that was disgusting. And I thought it was representative of everything that needs to change. But, you know, who's denouncing it, that? Who's denouncing that and saying that this man needs to go? because he is um, one of the prime um, you know, issues with police culture here in Philadelphia. Ted, I know you had your hand up to make a, uh, ask a question. Uh, Ted Bear is a Southwest Globe Times newspaper, which is uh, reports on half of your constituency, uh, Councilwoman. Hello. I was, uh, I've only been privy to the newspaper reports on Mr. Wallace's uh, uh, killing. But I got two things. Uh, first of all, there should have been, by protocol, a, a, a mental health professional of some kind that would go in, based on what was reported to the police, mm -hmm. should have gone on that, but quote, the man was not available. Yeah. And secondly, the police force in Philadelphia is only equipped 50% with non-lethal non means. They're only 50% of the cops have tasers. I think that's God awful. I agree with you on every count. Katie, um, I know you had a question. Would you like to pose it or? we could read it as well. Sure thing. Um, thank you so much for being here, council member, and for making time for this conversation. It's just meaningful to have our, our leadership with us in this moment. Um, one question I have, and it's probably because like, I'm a policy nerd, is at the end of the day, some of these decisions are made by dollars in the city budget. And I remember around the time of George Floyd's murder, there was a lot of pushback about the city police budget. and. I think like the increase got cut. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about investing in community services and investing in mental health services and professional professionals and investing in non-lethal weapons, it's money. So how as Philadelphians do we make our voices heard in those budget decisions when the dollars are actually being awarded to police versus something other than police? Yeah. I am a champion of the defund movement, movement, even though we didn't um, get to where we wanted to be with this past budget. Um, this, with this past budget, you're right, um, council was able to coalesce around rejecting the, the proposed $14 million increase. Where we couldn't sort of um, find agreement was on what we were gonna do beyond that. Um, there were uh, several council members who wanted to make at least a modest cut somewhere in the area of $40 million. And we thought that that was such a negligible amount in a, in a you know, $727 million budget um, that they would be able to figure it out, right? Like one less helicopter or something <laughs> or two. Um, we couldn't get broad agreement. We couldn't get enough votes um, on making even a modest um, cut to the budget. Um, there's a piece of me that thinks we need more time to make a clear roadmap and to get more council members and community members on board because every community, we have to be honest that every community member, particularly in neighborhoods that are experiencing, experiencing a lot of violence are not championing the defund movement. Um, I don't think there's clear agreement on what it means and people want to know that they're going to, you know, at the end of the day, um, be safe, right? And so I think we should use these next several months before 
um, the, the next budget session to peer into the budget, um, to see where we can make um, cuts, but also to be clear about what we're investing in. The structures that we're investing in have to be ready to accept that investment. Um, so like, you know, during the last budget fight, um, a lot of advocates were championing the, you know, defund, they were asking us to make $120 million um, cut. Um, but we had no plan for what we would invest in, right? Um, at the end of the day, we have to, um, we, we want to, we can defund, but we also have to know what, where we're putting that money, right? Because we have to have um, an alternative too. And so that's a conversation that I think we should have now. And I think we should make sure that community members are intimately um, involved in, in that conversation so that we are prepared um, for the ne next budget cycle. Thank you. I really appreciate Yeah, I appreciate that insight too. I think that's something that we can all take action. Um, you know, for me in, in, in these instances, I feel like we talk and sometimes the action doesn't get taken and that is very actionable as to what we can do and how we can help. Um, Mina, uh, I think was going to unmute and ask an additional question as well. Hi, yeah. Um, this is more bigger picture, but I think a lot of us felt the pain and frustration after like Brianna Taylor's um, uh, result and just like seeing how this really comes down to the actions of an individual at the end of the day. And it's frustrating to see that a lot of these instances go um, just like not held accountable. So um, how can we as individuals start to really affect that change um, that needs to happen? We need a change in the police contract. Um, the, the, you know, the city negotiates the police contract with the police union. Um, and you know, sort of the philosophy of the union, right? Um, to protect officers at, at all costs, no matter what the situation. And so we have a police contract that doesn't allow for a lot of accountability. Um, and the police contract is, um, and so there's this uh, the local issue of the negotiations between um, the, the mayor and the FOP, but there's also a state issue um, which, which dictates um, the changes that we can make to that contract into the arbitration rules. And um, the state piece of it um, is influenced by who we vote in office. Um, and to date, we haven't had um, folks who are supportive of there being more transparency and accountability for the police outside of the Philadelphia delegation. Um, but, you know, I believe in people power. I believe in people power. I believe in advocacy. Um, and I think if we keep our foot on the gas and we push our leaders for change, we will get there regardless of, you know, the, the, the barriers um, that exist. Council member, thank you so much. Um, and I think your insights have been incredibly valuable. We appreciate your time here today. We want to respect it, um, recognizing that uh, we know it's been an incredibly challenging week for, for you um, and for the community broadly. Um, I'm going to turn it over.